Without any further ado, I would invite Rachel to come and share all the wisdom with us uh, from her book today. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is so weird. I am usually the one who's hosting people at Google <laughs> as, a t as a person who helps authors have their message come out in the world. And today is, is quite the occasion because I actually have a book that I get to share. And today is the official world premiere. Woo! <laughs> I get to say that because it, it's actually launching officially today. So you guys in the room are, and on the video are like the first people in the whole world of 7 billion people to hear about pause. So it's pretty exciting. I'm really glad you came today. And I'm excited to share my message. I'm excited to share more about what's happening with pause, my story. I work at Google in San Francisco usually. So I'm on the um, I'm on a team for the sales world underneath the platform team called the PDC. Uh, shout out to them. Hi, I know you're on video. And uh, I've been at Google for nine years, which is quite extraordinary in itself. And I was at DoubleClick before that. So that's all in the book. I'm not going to get into it too much. But that's a little bit about me to get started. And a couple things as we go along here. So I just put this presentation together last night. I was like, should I have some slides? And knowing I've hosted authors before, I was kind of thinking like, well, I guess for the visual learners, that'd be good. And then I, I put some slides together and realized I didn't have anything on it other than pictures. <laughs> so that, this will be fun. I'm excited to, to share. And all of the quotes that you'll see today are from an in pause. And they're basically quotes that really spoke to me, quotes that I thought were inspirational or really helped resonate a message. And then I put some quotes up there, too. So I have a couple quotes. And I have these uh, in my page, on my Facebook page. and just enjoy the pictures and the quotes and like I think they're great. So today my whole objective and my vision is to have fun. I want to, I'm just really excited to be here obviously and I'll be talking a lot but I also want to answer questions so we'll leave time for that and then we'll talk some more and you can get your book. So there's books available outside. <laughs> Glenn's here from Books Inc and there's some, I put the link on the slide so you can see where to get them if you're online or want to want to get a book somewhere else. And just a note before we jump in, um, <laughs> this is not a Google presentation. And I get to say that because I'm a Googler. And, uh, and, I, and I also want to just have some fun today. So no templates, uh, you know, just all quotes. I'll have some fun and really hopefully sharing my message. And for those of you who are not in the room, there's like 100 balloons in here. And you've got a couple here you can see. But I'm pretty excited because I didn't put the balloons here. But it seems like they were meant to be. So whoever left the balloons, thank you. I, I feel very festive with the googly balloons here. So uh, I saw this meme. And I had to put it into the deck yesterday because this is what I feel like right now. This is me. Well, OK, I'm not a stormtrooper. But two of my worlds colliding here where I love Muppets. I love, I love Star Wars. But really, it's like my worlds are colliding where I'm a Googler. And now I'm giving a talk, and pause is out in the world. So it's like shit gets real. And I'm, I, I block that out as a word, but I just said it, so it doesn't really matter, um, so that the NC double 17 people don't, uh, don't veto my, my presentation out there. But yeah, this is a really interesting time for me. And it just feels good. And it's like, OK, the worlds are merging. I've had pause. I've been writing it for five years. And then I've got Google. I've been here for nine years. And it's like they've been separate. Sometimes weaving in and out, but now it's like boom, they're together. So it's it's a really cool thing, and I and I uh, I like that they're together. And I don't know about Muppets in Stormtrooper outfits, but you know you can send me feedback on that. Um, I did not create that meme; it was on the web. <laughs> yeah. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We'll we'll be talking about my story, and then I've got some parts of what we'll talk about today that are in pause. We'll even do a demo, and I kind of use the demo as a, a joke as a term, but. The idea is that I want to experience pausing and take you through something today that I think will be helpful for all of us. And just a really quick experiential, I'm all about the experience uh, of, of what you can do to intentionally shift your behavior. So we'll talk about the five signs you need to pause, the types of pauses. I'll take you through what I think mental flossing is and this technique I came up with called tasering for your limiting beliefs. <coughs> And why all this matters? Why do we need to pause? Maybe you know already, but I'll give you my version of that. And then keeping it googly, 
that's for all the Googlers. Next steps in AIs, because we're so action oriented here. Um, really what that means is takeaways or you know, something else, but yeah. Okay, so my story. Hopefully you can read the, the quotes up here too. Um, so this is a lot of everything I'm gonna say is pretty much in pause today. So um, what, what I wanna share the most is, is uh, basically my, my story. So back in 2011, 2011, I'd been at Google about five years and I was in a role in the GTech community, which is our internal service, customer service uh, team. And I wasn't doing well. For whatever reason, things weren't going great. I was kind of just in this rut. I was burning out. And how many people, just show of hands, uh, has ever felt that way, like in a burned out state or just rut, and you can't figure out what's going on. You're like, what's going on? I feel like I'm doing okay, but for whatever reason, things aren't working. Yeah, so in the room, a lot of hands were raised. And the idea is that <clears throat> I, it wasn't about effort. I really wanted to do well, but I was kind of new in the role, about six months in, managing a team of customer support, manage, uh, support people, <clears throat> and things weren't going great. I was getting feedback that my performance wasn't doing well. My performance was suffering, and I actually had this whole list of things to improve upon, which were very tactical and helpful for me. So I had this like plan in, my, in place. Hold on a second, I've got some water here. And I didn't know what to do. Everything I was trying, I was like, today is going to be different. I'm going to go in there, and my meetings will be different. I'll communicate effectively. I'll be more present. I'll have other things to share. And to whatever effect, I just kept feeling burned out. And my, my mental state was one where I was feeding myself stories that things would never get better or that I wasn't doing well. Uh, tapes, I call them, played in my mind like, <clears throat> Rachel, there you go again. Why are you even bothering? Or why don't you just quit today? You're, you're a failure. <clears throat> so all of this was going on. And I reached a point where my manager was basically like, this isn't a fit for you. And that was one of the signs, by the way, that you know you need a pause when, you, when someone tells you it's not working out. So I was faced with a choice. And I went home that day. It was a Friday afternoon. And I went home, rode, riding my bike home in San Francisco. <clears throat> and I was like, what do I do? I'm like, do I quit? Do I just keep trying? And, and I think I like Google, but I don't know. And my mental state just wasn't in a place to really think clearly. So what happened was I got on a Skype that weekend with a couple girlfriends. <clears throat> and someone suggested that Google might have this leave of abs absence program. And I was like, oh, that's right. They do have a leave of absence program. I should look into that. And so that weekend, I spent researching the leave of absence program and <clears throat> made a case to take three months of unpaid leave. And so <clears throat> Monday morning, I came back to Google, and I made the request to my manager. And she was as surprised as I had been to learn that we had a program or that, we, that would be a good idea, and said, that sounds like a, like a good fit as well. Let me take it to HR and, and see if we can get it approved. And what happened was I got it approved. And this was my first of uh, the beginning of what I would call my pause, which I define as an intentional, any intentional shift in behavior. So it doesn't mean it's a long-term break like I had, but it can be. So I ended up taking three months of unpaid leave in July. Uh, it was the summer of 2011. And the terms were that I would come back uh, to Google, ideally, but I wouldn't be in the same role, and I would hire a replacement when I returned. And so all of that happened before I left, which was great. I had about a month and a half to do that. And I didn't know if I was going to come back to Google, I actually. And I just really had no idea other than I knew I needed to to move into a new state, and I couldn't continue as things were going. It wasn't effective for me, and I really wasn't happy. So that's a little bit about the background of how this all happened. And you know, looking back now, five years ago, <clears throat> if, I'd, if I'd known any of this would have been the case, and this would be how things have turned out, I would have been really surprised, because I was just about the end of my rope, and not sure of what to do and, uh, and, and what had happened. So that three months of unpaid break was me unwinding. It was me kind of reassessing 
where I wanted to go. I didn't know if I was on the right career path. I didn't know <clears throat> if I should stay at Google, but I, I was pretty sure I liked Google. And it was really this unknown time for me, and it was the first time in my life for a few things. And one of them was to really be with myself, and meaning looking at my career, looking at who I was, and being like, is this what I want? Is this the path that I want to stay on? And so that led to a whole other bunch of discoveries, many, many discoveries since then. So the good news is that was the opening, I'll call it, kind of the first doorway that I walked through. And then that led to a lot more that ended up happening as I did return to Google in September of 2011. And I looked for a new role, and I got a new job, which is the job that I have now and the team I have on, that I team I'm on now. So that is my story in a nutshell. And so since then, I came back to Google and about uh, maybe about eight months later, I started thinking about wanting to share my story. And I didn't really know how to do it, but I started to write a document, <laughs> which later became the book. And one of the, one of the first themes that I captured was, how do you know if you need this so-called break or pause or a shift in behavior? And so I came up with these five signs. And each of these signs, the idea is that you might have one of these happen to you, or maybe all five of them have happened to you. In my case, uh, and I'll go over them in a second, I think I had all of them happen to me. <laughs> so I kind of did the tally and, and decided that, yeah, this is a good way that you can pause. So I'll walk you through the five signs. The first sign is you used to love your job, and now you loathe it. Pretty self-explanatory, right? I thought so. So that was my case. I used to really enjoy being at my work in, in the day to day. And all of a sudden, it was like just things weren't going great. And I didn't even want to be there anymore. So that was the first sign. Second sign um, was, let's see. So there's, yeah, so, so you, need a, you know you need a break. And then, um, yeah, you still love your job. And then your, your manager tells you it's not working out. I mentioned that this one was also experienced. So this might come as a really direct message. It could be something you hear in the hallway. It might be something a, a coworker says to you, or even a friend who's like, you, you sound miserable there. What's going on? Um, but my, in my case, I call it the prover proverbial pink slip. But basically, it was, yeah, my manager is having a heart to heart with me and saying this really wasn't a fit for me. And, it, and looking back, and, and even at the time, I, I knew she was right. So, uh, so that's the second sign. And the third sign is that you have a technology intervention from a friend or someone who really cares about you or even just knows you as an acquaintance. And we can all probably identify with that one, right? The idea is that if you're on your phone all the time or you're missing out on relationships because you're tethered to a laptop, and I was. I was tethered to my email and I would be checking it like Sunday afternoons to get ready for Monday, uh, that's a sign. That's a sign. And if it's interfering with how you are with other people or your family or other ways that you want to be in the world, then that's a, a, a telltale sign, in my opinion. And the fourth sign is that there is a challenge. There's an overcoming challenge that you face. And this could be something like a health challenge or a family member that has become someone that you need to be paying more attention to or, or ill or sick or something like that could be a layoff, or basically an adversity, something that you're, you're faced with that isn't exactly what you'd planned, and now you got to deal with it. So who can relate to that one? <laughs> yeah, I think that one's a pretty common one. And then the last one is that there is actually an opportunity that comes up. So this one can be in a different, multiple different ways, but the idea is that there might be some nagging opportunity that you want to pursue or an idea that you have to follow through with. It might be something as easy as like a, a class that you want to take. But it could be something like a weekend with, with a friend who's, who's been, been wanting you to go for years on a certain trip. Uh, it might be an idea to have a business that you start. It could be a whole bunch of different things. And so the idea is that, again, this is an intentional shift in behavior. So if this is something that's going on and you kind of think about things more than even a couple times a day, then that might be a good sign to know that a pause is something that could be helpful. So those are the five signs, and I kind of went through them quickly. But the idea is if you go through each one of those mentally and give yourself a point for any of those, if you score a one, uh, that means you're doing pretty well. But if you have maybe even more than two, two or more, chances are a pause would be a really good idea. And the good news is 
everyone can pause. And that's a big message I have today, is that it's not about this long extended break. This is literally about being intentional and being, being with yourself to know what you need to do for you, whatever works for you, whether you've got resources like time or money or activity. And all of those are levers that you can play with. So there's many different types of pauses to have, and I mentioned this right there. So <clears throat> they, can, they can go from a simple thing like following your breath. And how many people here do any types of mindful meditation or just kind of, yeah, a lot of hands are going up, ways that you can practice being in the moment and being with yourself. And it might mean a, a walk where you're being really mindful around the block. Or it might be a conversation that's more engaging than what you would normally do having a deeper level of engagement with a person other than yourself. All of those I consider pauses. Again, it's an intentional, intentional shift in behavior. Other ideas for pausing. So digital device pausing. So this is a big one. So digital device pausing, if there's a, a idea where you're, you think you're on your phone too much, or it's, you're checking it when you go to the bathroom, or you are sleeping with it under your pillow. <laughs> things like that. I think they're actually real cases. And the idea is that that's OK, but, but make sure that the boundaries that you have for those digital devices are in, your, in service to you. So is it taking you away from being with others or the moment? Or you're not really fully present in one activity. So digital device pauses are a big, big deal. And more than ever, they matter. And uh, you can experiment with that. So it might be setting up an, uh, a, a rule for yourself. I'm a big fan of rules. So you can kind of get into some boundaries and creating things. So not checking your phone after 9 PM or staying off social media on the weekends. Uh, that's one I, I actually recently started, and I liked it. Although it won't be happening right now. <laughs> uh, then you can kind of expand from there. So there's other ways you can pause. And if you have time to do it for more than a day, or it could be a weekend or a week, and then there's the extended pauses like I had for three months, which is amazing. And not a lot of us have that luxury, I know. Uh, there's actually a statistic from the Society of Human Resource Management that says about 14 to 15% of global companies allow for unpaid or paid breaks. There's only 4% of companies that have paid breaks. So knowing that's not a, an option for a lot of us, my point is that you can pause and integrate that through your life. It doesn't have to be a long type of break that you need to take. And then the other type of pause is the unintended pause. So this is when you get laid off, or you have this huge shift that you weren't planning to have. And I think a lot of us go through this at some point in our life, but the idea is that it's, it's easy to get stuck in a, in a victim mentality or maybe just kind of sulk around and now say, well, now what? But the actual idea is if you are intentional about it, that time is an amazing gift that you can have for yourself and choose how you want to live differently. It might be during that time, or it might be shifting careers, or it might be looking for something that really does align with you more. So those are all types of pauses and great ways to integrate intentional shifts in behavior. And there's even a thing called mini pauses. Uh, I, I write about these in the book from Dr. David King Keller. He did a PhD on pausing, which is pretty cool in my opinion. And there's a, there's a couple exercises in the book, and, and maybe we'll do one of those in the demo. <laughs> Look at that. So uh, next, we're going to try one of these out. And we're a little limited because we're here in the, in the room. But if you're with me in the room, go ahead and uh, just get comfortable and maybe put your feet on the floor. If you're not on the, in the room and you're watching this at home or at work, do the same thing. Follow along and, uh, and try how this is for you. So we're going to try one of these uh, micro pauses from Dr. Keller. And what we're going to do is, uh, I think it's called the two palm pause. So go ahead and I'll, I'll face this way. Uh, put your two hands up about six inches from your nose. And notice your hands. Scanning them for the texture, lines, color. Notice your breathing. And go ahead and put your hands down. How did that feel? Did anyone notice a shift? I, I did. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a 30 second, literally a 30 second pause that you can take. And uh, it really does wonders. And there's a couple more like that that he has. And then the, my favorite go-to is just following the breath. So you can go ahead and put one hand on your belly or your stomach. Go ahead and inhale. And exhale. And do it one more time. Inhale through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. And you can close your eyes or open your eyes. We'll take one more. And go ahead and open your eyes. So that's the daily breath pause. And again, that took maybe 30 seconds. And these, in every chapter, I have exercises that you can try that are related to pausing or journaling exercises. And the idea is that you can increase that time or go up to 10 breaths and count to 10 and, and, and increase your skill level in it. It's actually more like lifting weights at the gym. So those are some really quick demos that we just did. But the idea is that, again, it's about what works for you. So as you decide and think about what kind of pausing would resonate with you, it might be things to do outside. It might be journaling. It might be these micro pauses. It could be a weekend, a solo retreat for yourself, as scary as that might sound. All of those are options. And I encourage you to look at what works for you and see what, what, would, what would really resonate and then try it. Because the idea is that everything is an experiment. And in the book, I talk about Dr. Carol Dweck and her growth mindset uh, research. Has anyone heard of Carol and her research? I think most of us here have. Yeah, so the idea is that if you bring your curiosity and an open mind and that childlike uh, understanding of what, what, what could I learn here, learning and growing, then you will likely learn or grow. <laughs> and if you have that fixed mindset, it's not so easy and you kind of shut down and are closed off. So I invite you to bring it your pause, your, I call it the pause mindset <laughs> as well. So it's this idea of being open to ideas and then acting on it. So those are a couple demos and, and uh, they're in the book as well. Another idea that I have um, for pausing. And I talk a lot about this where we've got limiting beliefs in our world. And a lot of what I've been studying at the Wright Graduate University and Wright in Chicago, the Wright Foundation <clears throat> with Bob and Judith Wright is about what are our belief systems and where do we, where do we operate from? Because each of us have these in our, in our minds and our heads and it's how we see the world. So this technique I call the taser technique. And I think of it like mental flossing is the kind of the overlay here where think of, think of like dental floss and you're kind of going in between your teeth. I'm a, I'm a big flosser. I don't know if we got any self-devoted flossers in the room, but if you are in there and getting in between the grooves in your teeth, you're cleaning out the gunk, right? And we can't really do that with our minds because they're obviously not accessible that way. God knows what would happen, but you can think of it metaphorically and know that when you are mental flossing, you can do this, you can have the same effect. So that means being conscious about what your thoughts are and what your beliefs are. So tasering is an acronym and it stands for tune in, acknowledge, uh, shift, express, and repeat. So, so the idea is that any belief that you have that you don't think is accurate. So um, we'll do this together. So go ahead and think about so far your day and maybe you've got an hour that you've been in traffic or uh, you're late and you potentially had an argument with, your, with a partner or anything like that. <clears throat> Go ahead and what was, the, what was the thought that went through your mind about you as a belief? In my case, um, you know, I was preparing for the talk. I was looking at emails for my job. And I was like, why am I looking at emails through my job? Like, I, I'm, I'm not prepared. Like, I'm not enough. That's a big one for me. So that's a belief that I have. I'm not enough. So if I were to take and apply the taser technique and think of like taser like a zap, like these stun guns. So T is tune in. So, oh, okay, so my belief is I'm not enough. Okay, well, that's great. Acknowledge it. Okay, so that's my, that's my belief. And I'm not judging it. I'm not like, there I go again. There's, no, there's not really a critic there, but it's just acknowledging that and simply knowing that. And shift is what is the new belief that I would want to replace that with in this outdated system I have in my my mental map. 
So my shift would be pretty much the opposite of what my belief is, which would be, what is it? I, I am enough. Yeah, it's really simple. It's just pretty much the opposite. And it's about me. It's not about somebody else. It's about me. So, oh, I am enough. OK. And then expressing that is either saying it under my breath. It depends on where I am, but I could say it out loud. I am enough, like right, I am right now. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> or I could be writing it in a journal. And the idea is when we express, we are creating new mental maps in our brains. The neuroplasticity is there so that we can change the, the way that our minds are working. And over time, as we repeat this, the R, we're creating new ways of thinking and new ways of being and new habits. And it's not going to happen overnight. This is a long haul process. But the idea is that if we actually become conscious of this, and this is one tool you can use, then you might actually be able to shift some things around that are in better service to you. And so that you end up feeling more satisfied or not as down in that mental mind tailspin like I did when I was in my, my burnout phase at Google a couple of years ago. So that's one tool. And I invite you all to give it a try today at least one more time. <laughs> OK, so we're not done yet, but I wanted to just go ahead and ask, uh, actually, answer any questions that you have that have come up so far. So uh, you, thank you for mentioning those five uh, identifiers of when someone needs a pause and then doing a pause. So should the pause be there should there be a preconception before the pause that what should one achieve after that or should it be open ended okay yeah so the the question is sh should it be open ended oh it's a good question because i think that's the first question we all have we want to jump to well what does this mean and do i need to have it figured out and i know that was my <laughs> my question and i didn't and i was kind of freaking out about it cuz i didn't know what would happen so I, so I call this the pause paradox. And, it, and the idea is that we're, we're taking a step back to be and not be so busy or do. And our human mind type A thinker brains want to figure everything out really quickly. And so the, the paradox is you've got all this time. Why would you not want to figure it out and think about things as you reflect or you shift your behavior? And my thought is, I think it's good to have broad strokes. I think it's healthy and, and a really good thing to do to set your intention. So what do I want to have come out of my weekend as I reflect on my career shift? Or uh, what, is, what are the three things I, would, I, miss, I feel like I want to do more of with my family? And that's intention, right? Those are changes. So I think broad strokes are really good. And then I think the little things, like, well, how am I going to do that? What am I going to, what are the, the 10 things I need to do today to make sure that I stay on track are maybe not as good. And again, it's an experiment. So I think it'll be different for all of us. And I think it depends on what works for you. But I invite all of you to actually not plan because I think it's easy for our brains to get into that. And the whole gift and the magic of a pause is maybe being out of your comfort zone and not controlling everything. Potentially, it could be to let the magic happen, as I say. Like, being out of your comfort zone is scary. And, and we have a lot of fear in our own heads that prevent us from wanting to do that, based on just safety and the psychological safety of wanting to know what's comfortable. So when we start <clears throat> letting things just go, we kind of want to go into a panic mode or change things. But in general, I'd say, well, why not just be and not have a big plan? And you, if you set your intention and know what you want out of it, I think that's a really good way to go. Because you kind of have a guide, that light on the horizon, but you don't have to have all the minutia steps. And then that's the routine that we know and where most of us are used to. So you're not going to really change a whole bunch if you're in that routine and wanting to stick to what you know. But I think it's an experiment. Good question. Yep. So you said that you were working pretty hard, putting in all the efforts before you took a pause. And after pause, you were very, like you said that you, you are happy and you are satisfied. So mm -hmm. what were the key things uh, in your day-to-day -day life changed? What type of approaches changed towards um, your work that you felt the other way? Yeah, what were the things that changed? So in my case, I took this three months break. And I knew I needed to take myself out of the system. 
which was work at the time, and allow myself some new space. So I did that, and what happened was I learned a few things about how to be present for me, to, meaning how do, I, how do I engage with someone else and really see them eye to eye, like have eye contact and appreciate the conversation I'm having in the moment with them. Um, and I didn't really do that before. To be fully honest, I think I just kind of surface level engaged with people and I didn't have that presence. And so there wasn't a lot of meaning there for me, meaning um, I wasn't getting satisfied. I think I was settling for conversations that were okay and good. And this was in my relationship. This was with friends and at work. But when I took it to a deeper level and really wanted to be with someone and see someone eye to eye and be like, wow, I'm really, I'm really noticing I'm enjoying this conversation or I'm, I'm learning something about this person. That's pretty cool. It allowed me to feel more, feel more. And I think that was a big shift. I didn't know it at the time. And since then, I've done some personal development work and, and emotional intelligence. So I, I know now that was what happened. But I think it was being more present, honestly. That was like the simple answer. And then, uh, and then I did a few things on the break, too, that helped me align with my strengths. So I took the Strengths Finder uh, assessment, which is in the book from Tom Rath and the Gallup uh, poll people. And I, I, I lined with what my strengths were, so I actually felt happier because I was working in a, and, and I decided to go into sales because I, I actually just thought that I would be better managing relationships and creating relationships. And I was also asking my friends what they thought I was good at. And they told me that similar messages started appearing like, you're a great networker, you're a great communicator. Uh, it, had no, it actually was not the same feedback that I'd gotten in the job, which was very affirming to me. So. Uh, a lot of it was actually self-affirmation, self-validated intimacy, which is um, David Schnarch's term, which I quote in the in sight in the book. But it's a, it was about feeling good for myself, and I had never really done that before in a, in a level that, that changed how I thought about things. So I think it was a combination of things, essentially feeling more present and then allowing myself to be affirmed and feeling affirmed and enjoying the moments and, and feeling happier whether it was someone I was talking to or the job that I was really aligned with that played to my strengths more. And that's kind of what I, I think. All right, so what is the point? <laughs> Why are we here? What, what, what is pausing really lead us to? And I think uh, it, it's similar to the more broader mindfulness question of being more present with myself. But the idea is that if I can shift my behavior, so kind of like getting away from the pause language a little bit, if I'm just talking about choosing to be different, I mean, that's all this really is. This is my choice, your choice, our choice to change. And if I can actually not have a knee-jerk reaction, so deciding to take that three months unpaid leave, that was a long pause. Uh, but if I just choose to be different and act in a different way, taking some time, the idea is that New ideas might emerge, new ways of being might emerge, new thoughts might emerge. And I can change my behavior to align with what matters to me. And I'll say that again, because it's really important. If you're out there and, you're, and things aren't really going great for you or you want to change in some way, maybe one of those five signs happened, maybe you're feeling an itch to just do something different or you're not feeling satisfied. Satisfied is a really key part of this you can pause and shifting that behavior can allow new things to emerge for you, whether it's ways of being or ways of behaving or engaging with others or relationships, career, all of that. And you can lead a more satisfied and meaningful life. And my teachers in Chicago, Judith and Bob Bright, this is their huge message and theme that I continually learn from them. And if I'm with myself, meaning I'm, I'm emotionally present, I can feel my feelings, I know I'm in joy or I'm in fear, I'm in anger, I'm in sadness, I'm in hurt, and I can just be with that. And that's difficult, it's not easy. I'm able to be more with others and, and, and feel more satisfied because I know that I'm here and these beliefs are changing that I have, like I know I matter, 
I know I'm good enough, I am enough, I'm loved, I can connect. And these are, these are, these are topics called yearnings, which I won't get into too much today, but um, my mentor Judith Wright, this is her research. Um, but when we go and satisfy these yearnings, then we do lead more meaningful and satisfied lives. And a lot of the time, we're so busy in our heads, we are living, like I historically was, from my neck up. We don't tune into that, and we've learned over time to maybe shut it down or not pay attention to it. And that's OK, but the idea is that you probably aren't going to get too satisfied or feel a lot to know what really makes you come alive. And isn't that why we're all here? <laughs> isn't that why we're on this planet? And not to just be kind of chumming through life? And uh, I talk about this in the book. I have three types of people, and I kind of sum it up this way, where there's pausers, sleepers, and pause helpers, I think. And so pausers are the folks who choose to intentionally shift their behavior. And this can come in a num number of different ways. There's sleepers. So I, I kind of think I had the word zombie at first, and I was like, that's probably not a nice term. <laughs> so sleepers are folks, I think, who sleepwalk through life. And this was me. I think I, I slept through, even though I was a national rowing champion and I was a huge achiever, I, I wasn't on, on a level of really being emotionally present. Um, I'm probably being pretty hard on myself right now, but I take it with a grain of salt. So sleepers maybe wake up and pause one day, or maybe there's a pause helper. So pause helper is the third type of person where they potentially get you if you tell them you're taking a pause. They're not going to shut you down, or there might be a a way that they're encouraging and supporting you in whatever you're going through in life. And so uh, I think there's ways you can transition between any three of those groups, for sure. And maybe you go back and forth throughout your lifetime. I, you know, but the idea is that when you can pause and intentionally shift your behavior to generate ways of being that are new, or emotions that come up that are new, or new, new thoughts that you have, that can shift your life in a big way, like mine. So my life shifted, but, it, but these are little changes over time as well. They don't have to be this long break. So if you decide to turn your phone off at 8 PM every night, now you've got another hour. And it doesn't mean you're on Netflix two to an hour. You're like a lump on the couch. But you're actually <clears throat> uh, engaged with meaningful conversation with others, because I'm meeting my connection needs, and, I, and I'm feeling affirmed and validated again. Those things add up, and they allow you to be more present and feel more. And again, this is all going back to being more satisfied. And if we're kind of floating through life being a sleeper, it's not so satisfying. And it is on some level, if you want to rationalize that. But think about what could happen or what could change. What could change if you decided to intentionally shift your behavior? And that's kind of the whole point. OK, so that leads us to a pause plan. And the idea is that anyone can create their own pause plan that works for you. And a pause plan is really just, what would you want to do to start pausing? <laughs> what would you want to intentionally shift for your behavior? It can be a little small tweak in your day. It could be looking at your two palms for 30 seconds today. It could be uh, having a conversation that you've been wanting to have for two years and you've been putting off. And the book is filled with really how you can decide what works for you. And I talk about the pause dashboard, which is three levers that we all have and we can kind of adjust. So whether you've got a million dollars or one dollar or zero dollars, or all the time in the world, or five seconds, the idea is that you can create a, a plan that works for you. So the three levers are really the first one is money, finances. So <clears throat> like if you wanted to really dive in and take this high-end type of pause, you can, but you don't have to. And pausing isn't about luxury vacations, although it can be. But it allows you to think about what could you do based on your budget. And I actually have a whole worksheet on this if you wanted to look at plugging in some numbers. And it's on my site and in the book. And the next one is, uh, the next one is finance. Or, you know, we did finances, so activity. So what do you want to do? And pausing isn't about the quantity of time at all. If you've heard that 100 times in different ways, that's the case. Pausing is about the quality of time and based on what you'd want to do. So it's, this is where you get to choose, again, what you want to do. So it could be that walk in the park. 
And ideally, you get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Maybe, maybe it's actually trying to meditate if you've never tried it and decided always that, this, this, that you don't have time for it. Well, guess what? If you brought your growth mindset, maybe this is a curious thing for you and you can shift. And we all have that power. And then the third one is, uh, is time. So I talked a little bit about this, but time is really irrelevant. It's about what works for you. So between those three levers, everyone can come up with what works for you. And I, I think journaling is a great tool. It's also a way that you can express. And it also changes how you think about ideas when you put them on paper. There's, there's research on that, and it's, it's in the book. So journaling can be part of your pause plan. It can involve other people. And the idea is that how can you shift to lead a more meaningful life? And, and that's really the name of the game. And it's not to be a better pauser, although that's probably pretty nice. But it's really about what can work for you. So I hope all of you can walk out of this room or end this discussion and decide what you could put into your pause plan. And maybe just take a moment right now with me, kind of going back into that space. And close your eyes if you want to. Go ahead and take a breath. And ask yourself, what would I do? Who would I be if I had one minute, five minutes, an hour, days? to pause. Go ahead and open your eyes. And that is the power of pause. Thank you. I'll take more questions if you've got them. Sorry. You mentioned journaling. Are there any special techniques within journaling that you can relate, mm. that we can use as part of our reflection? Yeah. So the study that is in PAUSE, it's also in the Search Inside Yourself training, is uh, <clears throat> there's a, there was some research done that for two minutes a day, if you journal about an emotional experience, so you write in a book literally how you felt about something that happened, there's research that shows that you will be, you will actually process that differently. And um, yeah, and so now it's escaping me, of course, but it, it's actually leading to being more in touch with your feelings and changing how you feel about things. So it's a tool you can use to, to uh, harness that emotional intelligence and continue to build that skill. But two minutes a day, and the study, I think, was over a series of weeks, and, and they, um, the, the group that they, they, re they researched found that they had like a better, I think it was a better um, sense of overall happiness or, and something to that effect. I'm probably butchering the study. But yeah, it was interesting to me because two minutes a day, I mean, that's pretty easy to come up with, right? Whether it's in the morning or night. <clears throat> and if you actually did that about how you felt about something, so like, oh, you know, like such and such happened to me and I, I felt, and then name an emotion, I felt happy, I felt, I felt a lot of joy. It could be gratitude, but it might also be things that weren't so pleasant, like uh, sad or really frustrated and angry. And so the idea is that you're, you're activating different parts of your brain through writing, and it's also activating your emotional intelligence and therefore allowing yourself to increase that skill. And there's other research, too, about writing and how it operates different parts of the brain. And I've got a few of, that, few of those cited in pause uh, where it enhances your learning because it's in different formats, whether you're thinking or writing, and it, it reinforces it. Um, I'm curious about your long pause and if there's anything that you're really glad that you did that was, you know, any strategies that you actually did that, that changed your perspective and also how you would do it differently if you did it again. Mm, oh, boy. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, I, there were things that I did in my three months. So, so I kind of questioned, that, back to the question earlier, do I plan it all out? Or do I just do it? And so I had a real urge to travel. I was, I've always been a traveler. I knew I could do some crazy trip. I wanted to go to Argentina or something. 
And I actually had to pull my, I got, I, I got kind of real with myself and said, is that really the best thing for you right now? So I actually chose to not do things. I chose to not travel. I chose to be with myself, which was kind of scary, and, and just regroup a little bit. So, so that decision I thought was, um, like, that helped me a lot. And it was a choice that I made to really not do what I would normally do. And this is that comfort zone thing. My comfort zone was to go out on an adventure because I was pretty adventurous and I, I can do that and figure it all out. Being with myself and learning how I wasn't w working and maybe my career was a, a sham and I didn't even want to do this anymore was really scary and not in my comfort zone. And I didn't see it at the time, but in hindsight, that's actually really what happened. So I allowed myself, I gave myself permission to do that. And I knew I've, the, one of the responsibilities I had was knowing I may not want to be here anymore. I may want to switch careers entirely. I had this idea I wanted to do like, I wanted to do bike tours. <laughs> and I did actually in the fall of that year, along with working at Google. But I think it just uh, helped me allow myself some space to kind of come up with ideas. And what would I do differently? Um, what would I do differently? I think <clears throat> there were three things that I did that I actually really liked. So I don't know. I don't know. It's a great question. And maybe I'll think of something. I'm sure there's some things I could have done differently. But so one was choosing not to travel. But I did take a couple mini trips. So I took one to see my brother in Texas. I went to Burning Man uh, for the first time, which was a key part of my pause, by the way. It was the last week of my three months leave. And it opened up like me being more present as well to the life that I knew. I was like, whoa, what is this? place that people are in. And, uh, and then I rented a friend's home in Tahoe for a month. or Yeah, a month. So I would go up there on weekends. And so those were just cool little things that I did. But again, I didn't have to plan a huge trip because I think in my mental mind, I didn't want to take responsibility. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I wasn't ready to take responsibility to have a big to-do item because I wasn't mentally equipped, I don't think, at that point for that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? That was a good question. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. And I will be here to sign books. Thank you. Thank you.